couple more things. This is my dad's sister, Jeanette, and when I was in first grade, I believe, she gave me nine months of piano lessons until she had a baby and quit. No, you got better than I was. <laughs> Not at that age, no. <laughs> and she married Joe, the, as my grandparents said, the Italian. <laughs> and he is full blood Italian. Yep. And we've loved Joe ever since he came into the family. So that's who Joe is. And Joe and Jeanette lived here, went to this church for many, many years. Jeanette directed the choir. As a matter of fact, we sang the blood this morning. And we sang that in the choir many, many years ago. So Joe, take thank your you. liberty. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Is it all right if I come down here? Well, I got the microphone, so I guess I can. Uh, I promised the Lord, uh, I'll, we're going to be talking out of Ephesians 1 if you want to get there, but I promised the Lord uh, years ago that I would give my testimony because I want to give glory to God for all that he is and all that he does. Nine and a half years ago, I don't even know if my family really knows the details about this, but nine and a half years ago, I went to my uh, general practitioner, and she did a prostate exam, and she was doing that all along, but she said, you better, you need to go to a urologist. So I uh, went to a urologist, and they took uh, some samples of my prostate. And um, he said, well, you come back in about three weeks, and I'll have the results for you. Three weeks later, we go down, and Jeanette, sitting there with me, and uh, Jeanette says, well, what's, what's, what's the prognosis? And he said, you got six months to live, because I had stage four prostate cancer. So this was the urologist. I, I, we decided to go to a hospital called uh, MD Anderson, which is a premier worldwide, worldwide cancer center because I wanted to get a second opinion. So I went, they did tests, they did scans, and we went in, ta I talked to my urologist, oh, it was oh. oncologist, and she, she, it was a lady. And we walked in and said, okay, uh, what, what did you see? She says, well, they're right. You got six months or less to live. Well, that was a shocker. And I don't know about you when people say of your faith. Well, I had faith, but that rocked my faith. Because when somebody tells you you only have six months to live, it, it, it really gets to you. So they, uh, they did, because uh, it's a research hospital, uh, they, uh, they, wanted, they wanted to take my prostate out. Even, Oh, and by the way, when they said that, it was in the, it, it spread to my lymph nodes and into my blood. Bones. My bones, my blood, same thing. So. Sorry, we're a team. Yeah. <laughs> you mute that mic over here. <laughs> anyway, so uh, I had it. And they, when they did the scan, they, I, they showed it to me. There was black all over, black indicating there was cancer. And uh, so there was no, no hope other than that. So they wanted to take my prostate out and uh, because prostate has different kinds of cancer. Uh, so they took it, they wanted to take a sample out. And I said, why do you want to take a sample out of my prostate? So well, we, we want to inject this into a rat. Uh, this is a $20,000 rat. It's, it's in a pure environment, never seen anything but a cage and they wanted to see what would happen to the rat. Long story short, I, I kept going back because they wanted to see the, how it progressed and it was getting worse and it was getting worse and getting worse and I got tired of going back and hearing the news that it was getting worse. So months later, I walk into uh, the office. My oncologist is sitting there. She shoves up the scan and she looks at it and she says, she's has a puzzle, I couldn't see it. She had a puzzled look on her face. Now I have to say, 
before I did that, lots of people were praying for me. And I got into the Word, and every place I saw, he healed, he healed, he healed, he healed. I mark it. And I even went so far to put my Bible on the floor, and I stood on the Word, saying to God, this is your Word. And I believe it with all my heart. She put the scan up. She looked at it, and uh, I said, well, what's the, what's, what does it look like? She said, Joe, I can't see any cancer in your body anywhere. And I said, well, let me ask you, how's my rap doing? <laughs> well, they, she said, that's a funny thing, too, because the, can, the kid, rat never contracted cancer because I he was healed before they put the, yeah. Yeah. they test that. So that's, a, that's my testimony. God is a healing God. Yes. Ephesians chapter 1. Everybody there? Yep. Good. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, to the saints who are, excuse me, are, who are at Ephesus and who are faithful in Christ Jesus, grace to you, peace from God our Father, the Lord Jesus. Jesus Christ. Blessed be God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places in Christ, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that they would be, we would be holy, blameless before him. In love, he, predest he predestined us to the adoption of his son through Jesus Christ, who himself, according to the kind intentions of his will, to praise of the glory of God, his grace, he freely bestowed on us and the beloved. In him we have redemption through the blood, his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished on us in the wisdom of insight, he made known to us the mysteries of his will according to his kind intention. He purposed in him with a view of administration suitable to the faithfulness of the times that is the summing up of all things in Christ, things in the heaven and things on the earth in him. Also we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to his purpose, who works all things after the counsel of his will, to the end that we, we who are first in, to hope in Christ would be the, to the praise of his glory. In him, you have also, after listening to the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having also received, believed, the Holy Spirit of promise, who has given us a pledge of it is, is in our have inheritance, with the view to the redemption of God, own possession to the praise and the will of his glory. Most of us remember the uh, story in the book of Genesis. There was two brothers, Jacob and Esau. Twins, but they were totally different. I want to give you a brief overview of that story. Esau was the, ver Esau was the firstborn. So he went out hunting one day, and he got hungry. And when he got back, uh, his brother Jacob was cooking this big pot of Texas chili. I just put that in there, okay? <laughs> when Esau saw this, he said, I, you know, I would really like a bowl of that chili. So uh, Jacob said, I'll, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'll give you my bowl of chili if you give me your birthright and your blessings. And at that moment, that sinful need arose up in Esau. Esau, in, in his mind, the bowl of chili outweighed, it's amazing, outweighed the spiritual benefits that he was giving away. He made a snap judgment and he said, hey, that's a deal. 
he gave Jacob his legitimate rights to be an heir of the birthrights of his blessing and the birthrights of his blessing. And at the end of the passage, it said Esau despised, despised his birthrights. So what does that mean to be to despise your birthrights? To me, that says that Esau did not value the birthrights that were legitimately his, given to him at birth. And that's an amazing story to me that he would do that. So I want to talk to you this morning about birthright blessings. Birthright blessings. There's a story about uh, a little twist of Mark Twain's story. This is a story about a king and a queen, wealthy, powerful people, influential people, and that queen just delivered a little baby boy. The king and queen took that baby boy and put it in the royal carriage, and they went off and they started back to the palace. So what so happened, they crashed into another small carriage owned by very, very poor people. So confusion ensued when the, the two collided because the carriage they collided with had another baby boy just born. And, that, and after that uh, aftermath, the babies got mixed up. They got switched. The king and queen got the popper, popper's baby. And the poppers got the queen, the, uh, the, pop, the king and queen got the popper's baby. And the, so they uh, switched. And for the rest of the lives of those two people, they lived under a misconception. All the time that the king's kids grew up, he was very poor. And he had to go out and make a living. He had to go out begging for food. That, he was about seven years old when he did that. And every time he would go past that palace, he saw that little baby boy inside the palace. And in, in the confines of the security of it, he saw that baby boy had a lot of advantages being royalty. But he never realized he was, enjoy, he was born to enjoy those blessings. Are you getting the picture with me this morning? In hindsight, this is another humorous story told me by a pastor friend of mine. He, uh, he was pastoring church, and you know, he was there for a while, and he said, I'm, I need to be refreshed. I need to go somewhere to be refreshed. And he, he saw that the, they were having a, uh, a conference and that he wanted to attend. So he went before the board and he requested to say, I want to go to this conference. Can I go? Can you support me while I go to this conference? And they, the board got together. It was a small church. Uh, but they told him they, they would, he could go and they would pay for the registration to the conference. And they gave him enough money for a, a cheap motel. The board said, hey, we're sorry. We can't give you any money for the food. He said, you're on your own. So he went to this conference. It was a great opportunity. So he decided to go there and he would fast because he didn't have money for the food. And he got so excited, he went to this conference. He went to all the meetings and all the workshops that they had. He was really enjoying himself. He was being built up in the spirit. He was getting hungry, but he decided to fast. You got to remember, this is Monday through Friday. He's fasting. On Friday, a pastor friend comes up to him and said, hey, we haven't had the opportunity to fellowship with you at any of the meals. He was a little embarrassed. He didn't want to tell me he didn't have any money for food, so he went, he told him the truth. He said, I was spending my time in fasting and prayer. So he said, yeah, well, he said, we haven't noticed that you were fellowshipping, uh, fellowshipping with us. He said, this has been a great conference. And he said, wasn't it great that in the registration for you to the conference, it included breakfast and dinner? What a blessing. 
The pastor didn't realize in the registration fee it was paid in full. Why did he miss out? Because he didn't know the privilege that came with the ticket. He didn't know the privilege came with the registration. Why did the pauper son who was borely at birth, why did he miss out on the privileges? Because he didn't know who he was. Are you following me this morning? Am I losing you? I'm not hearing you. Thank you. We're talking about birthright blessings. I want to suggest you knew that it's an identical situation true to a lot of us Christians today. Christians sitting here, Christians sitting in churches throughout the country, as born again believers are born into the family of God. Our Father is the King of Kings, and He owns it all, and we own it all with Him. And by birth, we are privileged to be heirs of all that. And because of that, you and I are rich in the Lord. The sad part about it is that the Christians live in uh, spiritual poverty and they barely got by spiritually and they barely seek by in every area of their lives and sometimes they'll even go to their deathbed not realizing the benefits and the blessings they have in the Lord. That's a sad commentary. You know, there's a difference between having it and using it. There's a difference between possessing it and experiencing it. We will discover today that all Christians, all Christians are blessed. All Christians are blessed. Most Christians don't enjoy the blessings that God given to them at birth. Let's read from uh, Ephesians. We read from Ephesians 1. And I believe in those 14 passages that describes the believer's resources. There are different de- detailed descriptions of some of the blessings that we have in Christ, blessings that we have through Christ Jesus. And I want to focus on one verse, one verse, chapter 3, verse 3, uh, chapter 1, verse 3. Because this one verse pretty clarifies and describes what the topic is. Let me read for, uh, this for you again. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in, every, in, the, in the heavenly realm and with every spiritual blessings in Christ. Take a while to guess what that's talking about. Blessings. It's talking about Blessings. Before we look at the sixfold blast, uh, aspects of the blessing, what does it mean to be blessed? What does it mean to be blessed? The word blessed means to be endowed with something that will improve you. To be blessed means you are endowed with more, something more than you had. If you are blessed, it means that you are endowed with an ability to be successful in uh, certain areas and particular areas of your life. That's what it means to be blessed. And I believe you'll be shocked what comes out of that verse three. Six full blessings. Number one, the blessed one. Who is the blessed one in verse three? God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is the one we should be blessing, we should be praising him, we should adore, uh, uh, give him all our adoration, our lives. We should be blessing the Lord, God, our Father, Jesus Christ. Can I tell you something this morning? God is good. God is good. God is good. Come on, somebody tell me that God is good this morning. He's good, and he's good all the time. His very nature is being good. And there's, something, there's nothing more appropriate than, be, than believers being blessed God for his greatness. Blessed be the Father God of our Lord Jesus Christ. So who is the blessed one? God is. 
The second aspect of the blessing is the blesser. Who is the blesser? God is the one who does the blessing. Notice what it says. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us. God is the one who does the blessing. In fact, he is the supreme blesser. He is the source of every blessing that we have. That the blessings that come into your life doesn't come from your mother, doesn't come from your father, it doesn't come from your rich aunt or uncle. Blessings come from God. He is the supreme blesser. Let's look at chapter James chapter 1 and the 17th verse, and I'll just read it for you real quick. Every good and every perfect gift comes down from above, from the Father of light, with whom there's no variation or shadow of turning. So every good gift, every blessing, everything that is good that comes in your life is from God. He is the blesser of all things. He is the source of every blessing that we have in our life. Who is the blessed one? God is. Who is the blesser? God is. Now the third aspect is the blessed ones. Now it gets better, folks. It really gets better now. Who are the blessed ones? We are. We are are blessed. We are the recipients of God's blessings. In other words, if we look back at verse 1, it says, to the saints. He's not making a promise to all of humanity. He's clarifying that the blessings of God belong to the ones who are born again believers. And if you are born again believer, you are a saint. Now my wife tells me I don't act like one all the time. And neither do you. As born-again believers, that refers to us, the saints of God, the believers of God. The Word tells us in Galatians 3, verse 9, those who are of the faith are blessed. If you are of faith, meaning you are part of the body of Christ, then brothers and sisters, I want you to know this morning, you're blessed. You are blessed. We are the blessed ones. The fourth aspect of the blessing is, let's go to verse 3 again, and let's see what the blessings are. Who, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing. It's, just, it's interesting that every is inclusive. It's not limiting. It's a package deal. You have been blessed by God. You were blessed with every spiritual blessing. And amen would go good right there, I tell you. I went through the commentaries of the Bible and the programs on my computer, and some commentaries say that this is only referring to spiritual blessings, as if there was no material blessings in our lives, as if they're only relative to spiritual kinds of blessings. What they're saying is that God doesn't care about anything else in your life. Now, is that true? That's a That's a a false lie from the pits of hell. The word spiritual blessing is actually an English translation of the word in the Greek language, which the Greek word is nuitikos. It's the same word that's translated in chapter 1, chapter 12 and verse 1. Brethren, I don't want you to be ignorant of spiritual gifts. The, uh, The English translation for spiritual gifts is a strange word. It means things that come from the spirit, spiritual things, spiritual things, spiritual matters. But it's not limited to that. God is talking about every spiritual blessing, every blessing in the Bible, spiritual blessings, emotional blessings, mental blessings, family blessings, materialistic blessings, yes, materialistic blessings, financial blessings, relationship based, on and on and go. Every kind of blessing you can imagine, they are given to you and me in Jesus Christ. He is the source of all blessing. The fifth aspect of the blessing is 
the location of the blessings. Notice in verse 3 again. It says, we have been blessed with every spiritual blessing. Where? In where? Heavenly places. Heavenly places doesn't mean we have to wait to enjoy the blessings until we get to heaven. Yes, it describes the location of the blessing, but heavenly places doesn't just relate to heaven itself. It refers to the whole dominion of God. It, it refers to every, the whole spiritual realm of God. It's more than heaven itself. It refers to every part of the domain and the dominion and the kingdom of God. It all belongs to God. And I'll go one step further. The truth of the matter is, I'm a citizen of heaven, and so are you. We as believers, we have a dual citizenship. The Bible tells us that we live here on earth, so by flesh we are citizens of earth. But the word makes it so very clear that Christians, we are also citizens of heaven. We have another home. We are ambassadors of the kingdom of God, and the Bible actually calls us pilgrims. Folks, we're just passing through. We're just passing through. We have another citizenship. We are citizens of heaven. Boy, that should make you shout this morning. We are living here on earth, but we have a higher citizenship. We have a higher calling. The Bible tells us that Jesus Christ is seated where? Right hand he's seated by the right hand, but he's seated in heavenly places. And positionally, you are sitting there with him. And if you're seated in high, heavenly places, you're seeting with him. And guess what? you and get, get to enjoy heavenly blessings right here on earth. Are you folks getting this this morning? Yes. God has blessings for all of us to enjoy. You have to get this this morning. They are yours. They're yours. Every spiritual blessing, they're ours. And it makes, the number six is the aspect of the blessing agent. Now, it makes it clear that the blessing agent is, and I want to let you know that it's Jesus Christ. There are blessings in heavenly places in Christ. And listen to me carefully this morning. You don't, you don't possess these blessings because you, of your merit. You don't get to possess these uh, blessings because of your performance. <laughs> We're not good enough. We don't earn this. We possess these blessings be not because we are born into some physical family with lots of money. We're born spiritually into these blessings. We possess these blessings because we have a new position in Christ when we're born again. We were placed in Christ. When you and I started to, uh, to trust in the Lord Jesus Christ as our Savior, we were born into a marvelous union with Christ. So the reality is your riches are our, his riches are our riches. His experience is our experiences. His resources are our sources. Why? Because we are in Christ. And his victory is our victory. When you begin to learn this, it will change the way you think. When you get this into the spirit, it will change the way you think about your life. Let me give you an illustration. David and Goliath. Now, may, you might not have ever looked at it this way, but let me, let me go on with this. When Goliath stood on the cliffs, he said, Israel, choose one person that represents Israel. All the, all the Philistines would be 
represented by me. You pick some from some of her Israel, and I'll fight them. So he's saying, hey, we don't have to have everybody come out here and get their arms and legs chopped off. It just, you pick someone to fight for you. I re represent the Philistines, and the person you uh, pick represents he's of Israel. So what happened? David comes to the forefront. While everybody else chickened out, here comes David. David says, I'll do it because I know my God. And Dave comes to the forefront. And it's David against Goliath. In reality, it was Israel against the Philistines. But it was all, all focused on one warrior. That warrior was a type of headship, representative of the entire nation. When David took, went out and took on Goliath, what happened? Did they, what happened to David, what happened to Israel. David was a warrior. He went out, and if David triumphed, then all of Israel would triumph. Whatever happened to David would happen to Israel. Why? Because all of Israel was represented by David as he stood up against Goliath. Does anybody know what I'm talking about this morning? The truth is, when you put your faith in Jesus Christ, positionally, you positionally place in him, he is the source of all blessing. And over and over and over again in the New Testament it says, through him, in him, in Christ. Someone said the biggest two words in the Bible is, is in Christ. Christ, because you're not just you. You are not seen just as you. You probably don't view yourself as you, because why? You are in Christ. If you are truly put your faith in him, if you're born again, you are in Christ. It's the same way that David and Goliath triumphed, uh, David triumphed over Goliath. And the same way, when Jesus Christ was crucified, you were crucified with him. That's why it says in Galatians, I was crucified with Christ. When he was buried, you were buried with him. When he rose from the dead, you were raised from the dead with him. You were exalted with Christ. And you are seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Why? Because you are, and I are totally one with Christ. Everything that Jesus ex experienced is your experience as well. Everything that he bought is yours. Everything that he owns is yours. Everything that he is by your legal position in Christ is yours. That should make you shout this morning, folks. The sad commentary is that that can all be true and we can all live as paupers. We still can go around spiritually defeated. We go around defeated in life. Why? Because there's a difference between your position and your condition. You really need to get this this morning. Positionally, we have everything in Christ. Everything. What's our condition? Our condition is, I don't believe all that stuff. I don't believe it. That's our position, our condition. But I, if I move in my true position, it's all mine. It's all mine. The Apostle Paul in Scripture begins to unfold and reveal to us the magnificent truth about our wealth. 
The entire book of Ephesians is broken down to three things. Wealth of the believer, walk of the believer, and the warfare of the of the believer. Now the scriptures we're talking about today has to do with our possessions we have in Christ. We are in Christ. We're heirs and joint heirs and in Christ. And if we really can get this, if you can claim what God has given you this morning, I believe your life will change. You know, a lot of Christians don't want to believe that God wants to bless them. You know, any of their lives. But God does. God wants us to bless us in every area of our lives. You've heard it a million times. He owns a cattle on a thousand hill. But I want you to know something this morning. You own them too. Amen. Why? Because you are in Christ. When Jesus Christ died, he took all our sickness. He gave, we gave him our sickness, and I tell you what, he is, it's, he said, it's free. Take it. And that's what he's talking about this morning. We have every spiritual blessing in Christ Jesus. And I hope you all get that this morning. We are in Christ. And everything that he owns, we own. Everything that he is, we are. Amen? Amen. I just want to take a few minutes longer. And stick with me. Because I talked about spiritual blessings here this morning. But I'm going to talk to you about another blessings. See, God puts certain people into our lives that blesses us. He does. There's one person I want to talk about this morning who's been a blessing in my life, and he's been a blessing in your life. The Bible says, he's a man of courage, And it takes, it takes courage to be a Christian this morning, doesn't it? It takes courage to talk about, uh, talk about sin. And it takes courage to love again. This man learned to love again. He found somebody who he loved again. And you think about it, he's been a blessing in your life. He's been a blessing in my life. He loved his, his family. He loved his grandkids. And he loved people. And he spoke truth. He was a man that had a privilege to, to know. And that man is Jim Wilbanks. I want to tell you this morning, he will be missed. And we will miss him. But he's seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Amen? Amen. Amen. Amen.